So that was special. But what's your story? Um, and just, you know, the sad thing is sometimes our stories of Thanksgiving are not so good. <laughs> somebody didn't like the way the food was cooked. Somebody got together and didn't like somebody. Uh, and somebody got upset. Uh, and, and, oh my goodness, have you ever noticed that sometimes the holidays uh, bring on more negative than good at times? <laughs> All, all the things that stand out that are negative in a family, guess what? In the holidays, they come out. And partly they come out because everyone's like, okay, well, we're, not, we're just going to not pretend that there's nothing bad right now. We're all going to get together. And we're all going to love and like each other. Only when we get together, all the stuff still comes back out. And so there's conflict and hostilities. And, and it's like sometimes people leave the holidays, the, a day of Thanksgiving, not liking each other. I'm not coming back. And I'm not going to see you at Christmas. I'm going to stay away. From, you know, oh, my goodness. And this was supposed to be about what? Thanksgiving, a celebration. Well, today, we're looking at Psalm 107. This is the last part of our four-week series where we've been talking about Thanksgiving. Uh, yes, we're right. Uh, as you can see, there's uh, something else coming right around the corner, right? Christmas, uh-huh. So, so we're right there at the cusp of that celebration. But as we, as we do this, I want you to think about what's your story of Thanksgiving? And I'm not speaking just about this Thanksgiving uh, or even necessarily any particular Thanksgiving day. Thanksgiving is something that ought to happen in us and through us every single day. We ought to be able to find things to give, to give thanks for and especially to give God thanks and, and even to thank other people. But, but what's your story of what God has done in your life? You know, even if you don't know Jesus, if, even if you've never made a commitment to God, even if God, even if God commitment to God, you have a story. And if you look back, you will see that there's things that have happened in your life that, that as much as you've tried to control your life, you didn't. But something greater than you was at work. God himself has been working to draw you to him, has been doing things in your life, and that's part of your story. And we have a story, each of us, before we ever made a commitment to God, before we said, yes, I believe in Jesus, and we have a story that follows after we came to know Jesus. And, and what I want you to do is think about, am I giving thanks for my story? Frankly, it's your story that other people will be blessed by, it's, it's not by you telling them how bad they are or kind of standing out on the corner and saying, you know, you're all going to hell or anything like that. It's your story that people listen to. You think about that. When you're listening to other people, what are you hearing from them? When you're interested, aren't you interested in their stories and their experiences? And the same thing, the fact is, people are interested in, their story, in your story. And now, if you've had an encounter with Jesus Christ, you believe he's alive, you believe he rose from the dead, they might look at you and think you're a little weird, and that's okay, because you are. No, sorry. <laughs> but you have a story of God. And, and people want to hear that story, and they want to hear the good news stories that have happened in people's lives. Psalm 107, verses 1 to 9. We're just going to look at the first few verses of that psalm. The psalmist says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. There it is, folks. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. Those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and he fills the hungry with good things. The psalmist says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. This is the word good that starts right there in Genesis chapter 1. God looks at his creation as he starts to form it. In verse 4, he says, God saw that the light was what? It was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. Verse 10, Genesis 1, God called the dry ground land and gathered the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. 
The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. To govern the day and the night, to separate light from darkness, God saw that it was good. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And God saw, verse 31, all that he had made and by the way, verse 31, this is after he's made man and woman, after he's made mankind. God saw all that he made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Everything that God has created is good. And we give thanks because God is good. Whoops. Psalmist says, Psalm 23, verse 6, Surely, what? Goodness and love will follow me all the days of my, my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 25, 8, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. God's good. Uh, we, uh, well, there's, that's another story. And he instructs us, he guides us because he's good. Taste and see, the psalmist says in verse, chapter 34, verse 8, Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. He is a good place for us to go when we're hurting, when, we're, when we need security, when we need encouragement, when we need comfort. He is that place of refuge because the Lord is good. Oh, in Psalm 86, 5, you, Lord... This is a good one. You, Lord, are forgiving and good. And your love endures forever. Your faithfulness throughout all generations. God is a forgiving God. That's what makes him good, isn't it? He forgives us in spite of what we may have done. Praise the Lord, Psalm 106 says. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Psalm 118.1, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Psalm 118.29, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. The psalmist keeps saying that. Did you get bored with that? No. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His loving kindness, his love endures forever. Psalm 119.68, you are good, God, and what you do is good. So sing praise to him for that is pleasant. And Psalm 136, 1, and this one, the psalmist keeps saying it. The Lord is gracious. Excuse me, I skipped one. Great is your love. Higher than the heavens, your faithfulness reaches to the skies. For great is his love towards us, and the faithless Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. And the Lord is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. May your unfailing love be my comfort according to your promise. Give thanks to the Lord. For he is good. Have you heard any reasons in some of these verses I've read just now? Reasons to give thanks because he is good. He goes on, the psalmist says, let the redeemed tell their story. Do you hear it? Let the redeemed tell their story. And now I'll go to Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, the God of gods. Watch out. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. Okay, you're going to catch on. His love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders. You're catching on. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. Who made the great lights. The sun to govern the day. 
the moon and stars to govern the night. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder and brought Israel through the midst of it. But he swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness and even killed mighty kings, Sion, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and he gave their land as an inheritance, an inheritance to his servant Israel. He remembered us in our low estate and freed us from our enemies. He gives food to every creature. Give thanks to the God of heaven. And if you were listening to what you were just saying, God's love is constant and continual. That's what makes him so good. And we just heard the story of Israel, didn't we? We just heard a praise from Israel that God had taken Israel out of bondage in Egypt, had actually opened up the Red Sea, had gotten away from Pharaoh, had crossed that land. The Pharaoh's soldiers all died in that same water that they had just crossed on dry land. He now takes them into a land that he'd promised Abraham years before. He places them in that land. He removes the enemies from it. If they're willing to follow him, he, they will continue to experience his love because God is a faithful God and his love endures forever. And that's the story that Israel's just shared from Psalm 136. It's a story of salvation. It's a story of the redeemed. And, and Psalmist says, let the redeemed tell their story. What should we be doing, kids? Telling the story. And now he goes on. He says, tell your story of how God rescued you. Those he redeemed from the foe should tell their story. The word that is used there, same words translated adversary, the enemy. And it's not just a enemy. It's not just somebody who doesn't like you. It's the very enemy, the, the very one who stands against God, who stands against Jesus Christ. It's Satan himself. God has redeemed you from the foe. God has brought you out of slavery to the adversary. When you, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, God paid the price, set you free from that sin and the bondage to evil. God acted in the role, and this was interesting, he acted in the role of a kinsman redeemer. It's what Boaz did. The kinsman redeemer, the one relative who when there's a widow who has no one to take care of her, the kinsman redeemer is supposed to come and take care of that person, and that's what God did for us. God comes on our behalf and does for us what we can't do to meet our needs and dies for us. He is our kinsman redeemer. Psalm 32, 7 says, You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Though you, Psalm 44, 5, though we push back our enemies, through your name we trample our foes. And with God we will gain the victory and he will trample down our enemies. And some of us understand what it means to have battled an enemy. If you've ever struggled with sin, you've fought an enemy. If you've struggled and fought a habit, and that may have been an addiction, God was helping you to fight the foe your enemy. Tell your story of how God rescued you. I want to share with you a story from um, Robin Colleen Myers. The, this is their email that just came out. Their letter just came out this week. And, and, and they're reporting about their summer. Um, they've been so busy with the raves. Ro Robin Colleen are a couple of our missionaries that work with Plur Life Ministries. What Plur Life Ministries does is they th simply go to raves, set up oftentimes in a campground, also will go into the rave. The, the ladies will go in. They call them the moms, the rave moms. The rave moms now are getting known all across the country. Kids come looking for the rave moms and the rave dads. And, and, all, and they'll, they'll put up a sign, hu hu hugs from rave moms. 
um, and they give out these bracelets which tell the story of the gospel. Uh, and bracelets are one of the things that are really special at raves. Kids make them and share them with beads and all. Well, here's, here's their report. And this one is from the weekend of hard summer, Rob says. We had decided to do what we call a modified camping outreach. That means that, that normally they go in and they'll camp there for three days. They have, the, they have the rave dads making all kinds of goofy pancakes every morning. They serve peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in the afternoon. And it's really quite an elaborate affair that takes you know, probably about $5,000 worth of food just to feed these kids for these th two or three days. Well, they did a modified version, which just meant that they had one or two people, I think it was actually three, they were in the campsite just there and just giving out hugs and, and just talking to kids. And they had some other moms and, and a rave dad that were actually out working the parking lot. That's where they give out the bracelets. That's where they meet the kids as they go in and out of the rave. That's where they literally have saved kids' lives. In fact, um, uh, one of the stories Rob talked about uh, while they were uh, in, the, in the campground, a young lady came up with a young man, and they, and they never know when a guy's with a girl, is he there to help her, or is he taking advantage of her? Um, turns out this guy was a good guy, but they came up, she was obviously in, in danger. I mean, really serious. Her heart rate was going up. She was starting to have difficulty breathing. And eventually, they had to get the paramedics. The, the young man that was with her said, you know, please don't call them, you know, because, you know, she'll get in trouble and all. And, and finally, Rob said, I got, I got to go get help. And he goes running across the parking lot. He can't find a single paramedic around, so he gets on his cell phone, and he calls his uh, tow truck guy that they've got to know that's a part of, become kind of like an honorary rave dad, they refer to him as. And, and, and the tow truck guy doesn't even read respond. So Rob's running back. Well, as Rob's running back, the tow truck's pulling up, and the paramedics are right behind him because the tow truck guy, the, rave, the tow truck rave dad, had actually gotten the paramedics. They'd gotten the message, but he was so busy trying to get the paramedics, he couldn't tell Rob that they were coming. They had to take the young lady away because she was literally dying. And I'm serious. That, that's the kind of things, kind of situations that Rob and Colleen and the other rave moms and dads find themselves in. Well, Colleen goes on and says, uh, so we were sitting there working at the table. She says, it's common for us to have repeat visitors in our campsite. These kids crave the love and attention of Christian parents. Lauren, as they refer to her, was one of those kids on this particular outreach. We saw her every day. She was only unusual because while we are very used to seeing half-dressed girls in the raves, they are usually much more covered up in the campground before they get ready to go into the party. They are usually in shorts and t-shirts, but not Lauren. She stayed in her party outfit that consisted of a thong and pasties all weekend long. On the first day, she came by to get a mom hug. After seeing our free mom hug sign, she hung out with us for a long time. The next day, she returned for more hugs, and her story tumbled out. Between the ages of 16 and 19, Lauren had been taking care of her mom. She took care of her while she was uh, dying of cancer. And Lauren said she missed her mom so much. That's why she was there for the mom hugs. Thank God that the first time she came by, we loved on her instead of judging her. Thank God that our rave dad looked her only in the eyes and didn't turn away in disgust or for fear of lust. It was so obvious to, the, to this girl on that very first visit that all the ones that followed, and all the ones that followed, that she was cared for and loved by the moms and treated like a precious prodigal daughter by the dads. After the third time Lauren came by for a hug, I lost count of her visits. She would stay with us for long periods of time, making bracelets and talking. What happened as a result is something we call collateral fruit. You know, there's collateral damage. This is collateral fruit. <laughs> It's beautiful but unintended. It's a God thing that happens naturally when Christians are ministering his way. You see, other kids were watching how we treated Lauren. Other kids who never spoke a word but made bracelets of their own as Lauren chatted away would look at us, then at Lauren, then down at her uncovered chest, then back at us. It kind of made me smile a little. One girl, quietly stringing beads on an elastic cord, whispered under her breath, This is amazing. Another girl, Joy, and her friend, Janie, sat near Lauren at our table one afternoon. 
They too watched. Pretty soon, Lauren fitted off, flitted off to go find her girlfriend. And then the collateral fruit began to fall. This was actually Joy's second visit to our campsite. The day before, she had written out a prayer request and hung it up on our prayer wall. Yes, they invite the kids to leave prayer requests and they hang them on a string across their, the, the tent site and, and they pray for the kids and their prayer requests. And the kids leave incredible prayer requests. Did I say this is at a rave, not at a church event? Well, it is a church event, but it's not like what we think. <laughs> it's a total public rave musical event. She came to let us know that her prayer had been answered. She waited and watched until Lauren left to tell us about it. A beautiful but serious conversation ensued with all four of us rave moms and dads. Both girls kept saying that they felt like they were meant to find us in the campground as we took turns answering their questions and talking about life. And then something changed. And all of a sudden, it became apparent that Joy, who had walked away from Jesus, and Janie, who had never known him, both wanted to come home. Praise God. We all held hands as Joy prayed to come back, and Janie prayed for salvation. And she goes on to tell that some of the rave moms have continued to meet and do some discipling of the two girls. Rob says, you know, we had an inkling that this outreach was going to be amazing. This had been the toughest prep week for any outreach that we had had in over eight years. It was also the worst hassle we'd ever had getting our supplies into the campground. The enemy was hard at work trying to discourage us, and to be transparent, it almost worked on me. I wanted to give up and just forget about trying to have both a camping team and a parking lot team. I praise God for the other rave parents and our prayer team who would not hear of giving up. This is why God wants us to do things together with the body of Christ. If I had been out there on my own, I would have cried and gone home. Praise God for the story of the redeemed. And God wants us, the psalmist says, tell the stories of the redeemed. Tell what God has done to bring you to him. Tell how God has rescued you. And he goes on, tell the story of how God responded to you. Did you hear Lauren? She said, she comes back a day later and she says, guess what? My prayer got answered. The prayer I just put up there on the, on the card yesterday, that prayer got answered. We need to be talking about how God responds to our cries for help. If you continue to read the psalm, you'll find that there's a phrase that continues to happen. And it says, and the Lord, and the people cried out in help, for help. The people cried out for help. And every time that God's people cry out for, God, for help, God responds to them. These are the situations that, we, that oftentimes, friends, we get ourselves into rather than anyone else. It's no one else to blame. We've gotten ourselves there. And that's, what's the, that's the situation. Is for those who have gathered from the lands, those who have been out there in the, in the lands and have been out there wandering, you've been out doing your own thing. And, God, and, you, and when you're out there, you get in trouble. That's, that's God out there, and he's waiting for us to cry for him to, for help. F. Wiseman says the travelers would get lost. They'd stay in the wilderness, not willfully, but from lack of knowledge. They could find no place of, uh, to, to stay. Their food and water were exhausted, and they sank in faintness and despair, and a helpless prey to all the perils of the desert. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. He came to their help. He led them by a straight way that they might go to a city of habitation, to a place where they could get their needs met. They ought not to have started without a guide. But inexperienced is often self-confident and apt to despise the counsels of the wise. God gathers the people from the lands who are out there wandering on their own. He also gathers those who are wandering in the desert <laughs> where it's hot. The second class comes to him in trouble through disobedience. They rebelled against the word of God. They held God in contempt, despised his authority, and they ignored his law. It's man's power to go ahead and defy God. And when we're out there defying God, that's where Lauren was. She said, you know, I left God a long time ago, and she wanted to come home. 
when you're out in the desert place and you cry for help. God responds to that cry for help. He also responds to the people who are hungry and thirsty, who are in need of just basic needs, who are just struggling. According to the Old Testament, the Old Testament saw people who were hungry and thirsty. These are the people who were the sick. And, based, and they believed that people were sick because of something that they had done, some sin or wrong that they had committed, and a doctrine that they had, had turned on, and they had turned away from God. And because of that, now their, their iniquity, their sin is getting to them and messing them up, and they're hungry and thirsty. And God responds to the cries when we're hungry and thirsty, when we're hurting and sick. And to those who cry out to him in distress, the psalmist says, God hears the cry of those who are in distress, those who are grieving, those who are lonely, those who are depressed and discouraged. God hears the cry. And we need to tell the story of when God heard our cries. What does the psalmist say? Tell your story of thanksgiving because he has unfailing love for you. He has an unconditional love for you regardless of your behavior. He may not like your behavior. He he may want you to change your direction. But the fact is, is he's going to keep loving you no matter what. It's the story of the prodigal son going to a far and distant land who's left his father. And when he finally comes back, hoping just to become a servant in his dad's household, what does his dad do? His dad runs to meet him. How did he know his son was coming back? Because this dad loves his son so much that every day he watches and prays for him to return. And when he sees him in a distance, even though he probably hardly recognizes him, he runs to meet him. He grabs him. He puts his arms around him. And he welcomes him home. He calls for the fatted calf to be killed. He calls for a banquet and celebration because his son that was dead is alive again. And that's what he invites us now to say. We need to celebrate that God's called us back and loved us with an unfailing love. The psalmist goes on, he says, and he's had wonderful deeds. God's doing doing so much for us that we take totally for granted. We ignore way more than we realize what God's done for us. Wonderful things that he's doing for us. How many breaths have you taken today? How many of those breaths did you plan? Did you say, okay, it's time for me to breathe? You breathed because God gave you the ability. And there are all kinds of things, uh, way more detail than that, that God is doing for you every day. Times that he's protecting you, you just ignored it. Times that, that he stood with you and, and you weren't alone, but you thought you were. There's wonderful things that God has done for you because he loves you. Tell your story with thanksgiving. And he, the psalmist continues, it's for satisfying our needs with good things. We have way more than our needs being met in this country. (laughs) Some of our homeless are fed better than some of the people around the world. We threw away food after the Thanksgiving dinner. I know we took a lot of it a lot of places and, and, and off the mountain and tried to find people to give stuff to. And yet how many, I'm wondering, how many homes threw away food after Thanksgiving? God is satisfying our needs with good things. Tell the story. Tell the story of what God has done for you. One theologian said, the psalm is a, this psalm is a series of pictures, and they are not pictures of light and joy. They are scenes of distress and uttermost extremity. The lost traveler ready to die in the silence of the wilderness. The reeling sailor dashed with spray, watching every coming billow in the fear that it may be his grave. The fettered prisoner weeping his life away in the darkness of the dungeon. The sick and dying man clinging still to this life, but looking fearfully to another. Such scenes of extremity the psalmist paints. And while we are thinking that no deliverance is possible, lo, the difference is wrought. The traveler is on his way. The sailor is in his haven. The prisoner is looking down to the dungeon where he used to lay. The sick and dying soul is filled again with life. Such are the wonders wrought by divine goodness. (laughs) Three years ago, Debbie's dad gathered the family together. 
And some of you know this story. We gathered together in a room, and, and he gathered us there, he and mom, and the whole family was all, all united together in this room. And dad shared with us that he had a, an issue with his brain, that fluid was building up on his brain, and that they, they had a couple of options. One was just to let it go, and he would start losing his memory, his mind, all kinds of mental abilities. A second option was to perform a surgery on him to put a pump in his brain to allow fluid to go down into the spinal cord, which also had its uh, dangers that went with it. And mom and dad had decided that they were going to go ahead and do the surgery. And they were sharing with us that they were going to do the surgery, and they didn't know what would happen. Would, would he even survive the surgery? Uh, at that time, I think dad was uh, 86 years old and had been through a number of surgeries already. As he stood in the room that day, he shared stories with us and memories. He t Mom and Dad had um, always done vacation trips for the family. So they rented a place on Balboa Island all the years that our boys were growing up. And, uh, and, and all these cousins, uh, 12 of them, nine, 11 boys, uh, two girls, uh, so that actually 13, one died. Um, the, the cousins all knew one another because of the times that they spent down at Balboa Island. They used, to <laughs> they used to walk around the island playing follow the leader, doing goofy stuff and all. And, and it was just family times. And the family loves one another because mom and dad got them together every summer. And dad simply said, you need to know that I didn't do that all just for you. I did it for me too. I did it to have those special moments with you, those special memories and all. And so, and he's talking about that. And he, and he, and he prayed with the family and he, and thank God. He said, you know, this family has been blessed way beyond many. And he says, we don't talk about that at, at all, but he says, we, we are all blessed. And, and, and the incredible thing is, is that almost everyone in the family at that point knew Jesus Christ. At the end of the conversation, as he gathered us for prayer. He looked at us and he said, I just have one hope. I just want to be certain that all of you are there when the saints go marching in. And my question today as we end this message is God wants you to tell your stories. God wants you to be as concerned as my father-in-law about the family that the people around us will be there when the saints go marching in. And the best way for that to happen is for you to tell the story of thanksgiving, your story of thanksgiving, what God has done for you. Tell the stories. I'll, we can argue theology. We can argue opinion. We can argue all the things that you will tell somebody that, that, that's telling them what to do. But no one can argue your story. Tell the stories of thanksgiving so that when the saints go marching in, the people you know will be there as well. Let's pray. Oh, God. Every person in this room has a story and, and multiple parts to it. There, there, there are those who have had some just a s supernatural experiences with you, miracles that you've performed, healings, <laughs> blessings. You've, you've come, you've visited, you've invited us to know you. Each of us has a story that talks about what, what you've done in our lives. Uh, even if we're really not committed to you, we've got a story and if we look back, well, we may think we've done a lot of things on our own. Your hand was there and evidence that you've blessed us beyond ourselves. Thank you, God. Thank you for our stories. Some of us have stories of how you've redeemed us literally from a pit. You, you took us from a place where we were sinning, blowing it, addicted, in trouble, broken, wounded, and you grabbed a hold of us and showed us your love. We have a story that we've got to tell, God. Some of us, you're calling to a new story. 
to a new commitment to follow you today. An invitation you're making to us to say, I, let me be the heart of your story. Jesus, you've paid the price for all of our imperfections, all of the stuff in us that we get embarrassed by. You've paid the price, and you're now asking, let me be a part of your story, but let me forgive you and set you free from that garbage from your past. You want to make a new story for us. You want to give us new hope, new life, new joy, even a new calling. Some, I think, of the students, Lord, you're calling them not just into service of this country, not just to become officers in the military, but you're calling them to be servants in your kingdom, to serve you as they go to these uh, military schools and as they, uh, academies, and as they head on into their, their military careers, you're calling them to serve the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe. There's a new, new story you're trying to call us all to, God. And I pray, Lord, that each one here will respond to that calling that you're putting on our lives. Holy Spirit, some need a brand new story, a story of hope, joy, mercy, forgiveness, new life. I pray that we'll accept the calling to that new story. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would the worship team please come? <clears throat>